Hello Architects. In the last video, we talked about messages and the three different types of messages that you're likely to see in your applications, namely commands, queries, and events. Now in this video, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into the world of events and look at the different types of events you might see. Now to start, let's just define what an event actually is. Now event is a simply that there's a notification that there has been a change of state in a system. An event is typically immutable. It's something that has happened in the past. It can't be changed. Now initially, the idea of events might sound simple. You know, we've got these events, these things that have happened in the past and our systems can keep simply publish them. But actually we have different types of events. We have notification events, event carried state transfer, domain events, maybe events that um, are delta events, they just notify of, us, of, us that, of things that have changed. And that's what we're gonna have a look at in this video, the different types of events that you're likely to see, fat events versus sparse events, and even a little word on schema management. And we're gonna continue with the same application that we had for the video on messages. It's been refactored slightly just to reorganize things a little bit. And we'll actually start with um, one of the simplest types of events to get started with, and that's a notification event. And typically, a notification event is also what we'd know as a sparse event. There's very little actual data in a notification event. It is, as described, it's simply a notification. So you can see here we have an order created notification event. Now I'm being really explicit with the names of my events here. Maybe in the real world, you might not actually call it notification event. It might just be order created event. But for the purposes of this demonstration, it makes things easier to find in the repo and things. So we've got a notification event and an order created notification event just has a single property, the actual ID of the order that's been created and that's it. All we're doing is notifying other systems that a new order has been created. Now, this is really easy to get. There's a couple of good reasons why you might want to do this. The first is around schema management. There's very little coupling here at the schema level. We've just got one property, order ID. If we change how our order looks, maybe we add some additional fields to our order object in our order service. Well, that doesn't matter all that much because we're not exposing that data to the outside world. One of the downsides of using or uh, notification events is that that might cause some unexpected load back into your system. So imagine a scenario where I publish this order created event. If we look at our actual application code here, our order is getting created, we're creating it, and then we're publishing our order created notification event. But what if our dispatch system you know, the system managing the, the delivery of these orders. What if that needs to know more information about the event itself? Well, it's gonna to have to reach back into our order service to actually get additional information about that order. So whilst notification events are really useful, they should be used exactly as what they are, simply notifications where there might not be an expectation that the consuming system will want to reach back into our system. So the next type of event we have is what we'd call a um, event carried state transfer. And this is typically coupled with what we would know as more of a fat event. So if we look at this order created event here, this is very similar to the notification event. We've actually even got the same name of the message, but there's a lot more data. We're actually including the customer, the value of the order, the actual items included in the order. Now, the benefit of this is almost the complete opposite of the downsides of our notification events. We might use this event so that systems don't have to reach back into our system. Our dispatch service has all of the information it needs to know about the order. It knows the items on the order. It can start working with that without needing to communicate back to our order service and create that unexpected load of our uh, on our system the downsides of these more fat events or um, state transfer events is that we've actually got quite a lot of coupling now at the schema level because we've got so many fields in here that then means that any consuming systems are going to expect this schema to be consistent we're a bit less flexible 
with how we can change what the format of our message is. And this is where actually the message wrapper that we had in our uh, video messages. And if you've not seen that, I'll pop the link in the description. But we've got this wrapper object that's wrapping around all of our events. And this wrapper has um, a metadata section. And within this metadata section, we could actually include an additional property, which might be a string, and we might call that version number. And let's just add the JSON representation of that, and we'll call that version number. So what this means now is that our actual events, when they are published, they can actually specify the version of the actual payload. And this means that our consumers will know when to maybe expect a breaking change to our system. So if we update our metadata here to take in a version number as well, and then we'll set our version number equal to that version number. This is really useful um, to manage that schema changes and manage the, the way you can control the schemas as a producer without breaking your downstream consumers. So that's fat events or event carried state transfer. Now there's another type of event that's pretty similar and that is what we'd know as a domain event. And these are events that are really specific to your business use case, the kind of events you might see in an event driven architecture where the business events and the business functionality are what drive the system. Now you could argue that an order created event is actually a domain event as well, but I've added an additional example here of this order discount applied event. And this will get published whenever an order gets created that has a discount applied because one of the unique selling points of our business is that we are really good with discounts, for example. So this is something that's very specific to our business domain, how discounts get applied. So now we've got this additional event that is very specific to our domain. That is the order discount applied event. And we're publishing that in our order created handler. We're basically saying that if the request that comes in contains a discount code, if that command to create the order has a discount code, then we actually want to apply a hard coded 20% discount. In this case, obviously in the real world, this might be a little bit more dynamic. There might be um, some lookups required here to actually get the discount value. So that's domain events. And the final, and what I think is a really interesting type of event is what we might call a delta or event. The kind of thing you might see in some kind of change data capture. So you see here in this order update handler, so I've got two endpoints on this API now. I've got a endpoint for creating orders and an endpoint for updating orders. And this actual order updated event has two properties. It has old order and new order. And this is where we're actually publishing an event that gives us the old version of the event and the new version of the event so that consumers can see exactly what has changed. If we look at the handler here, um, we're creating, getting our order from the database. So we're getting our actual existing order, the command that comes in, the update order command simply just includes the order ID. So we can retrieve the order using the order ID. And then we're actually just updating the first name and last name here from the command that comes in. So our update order command includes the first name and the last name. We update the order and then we publish this order updated event specifying our old order and our new order. So now our consumers can come in and look at this event and they can see what, what was there, what has changed, and they can maybe use that to create some state in their, their own service. So they don't need to reach back into our system to get access to all the changes and things that have happened. Let's have a look at what some of these events look like now. So I can send an API request to my API to actually create an order now. So we've got this order new endpoint and we've got, of course, our SQS response back. If I now grab my AWS console window and bring that over here so that you can all see what's going on and we have a look at the latest log stream in here, this will actually give us information of the actual message that gets created. And you can see we've got a couple of things being published here. We've got our actual um, event that gets published. And this is our fat event. This is our event carried state transfer because we've got the order ID, we've got the customer name, we've got the value, the items, we've got everything on there that we might need. If we look at some of these earlier log messages, 
Here we've got our notification event. So we've got our big metadata section that we're expecting. And then actually our data section simply just includes the order ID for the order that gets created. If we now go back and hit our update endpoint, which I have happily handily got here, and we update this order to have a different first name and last name, Again, that's completed successfully, 167 milliseconds, wow. Um, come back into the CloudWatch console and we go to the log group for our order updated handler. And we can look at this event here. And this event is a bit more um, complex, but we've got the old order section here. And you can see in the old order, the customer first name is James and the customer last name is Eastham. And then we've got our new order section here in which the customer first name is now Ruben, customer last name is now Easter. It's actually quite a good job that my dog can place orders. There'd be dog biscuits everywhere. And we talked about schema management a little bit in the last video where we were looking at this message wrapper and the metadata data pattern. And I just want to touch on that again here because typically with events, the consumers are less known. You know, if you're sending a command, you kind of know where you're sending that command to and they're set up to receive that, the same with a query. But because events, typically you don't really know how many people are going to be consuming that event and how they're going to be using it, what they're expecting within the data, it makes the schema of your event one of actually the most important parts of coupling. So although event driven architecture is asynchronous architectures, start to reduce coupling. This is one of the really important bits. So having a schema that is consistent, that the consuming system can rely on to do some work is incredibly important. And having this metadata data pattern where you've got a consistent top level schema, at least across your entire organization, and then introducing properties like a version number so that your consumers actually know if the schema of the event has changed. So if you had to make some really big breaking changes to your payload, you could increment that version number and your consumers would know about it. If you mandate that across your organization, it really simplifies schema management. And in a later video, we're gonna look at schema and contract testing and how you can be more proactive is it in ensuring that you're not bringing in breaking changes or anything like that. So just to quickly summarize before we close up now, we've got four primary types of events. We've got domain events, notification events, event carried state transfer are sometimes called document events, and then finally delta events, typically events that notify that state has changed. And when you start working with events, you might just think events just JSON, I can just publish that and everyone's happy. But thinking about the type of event you're publishing, think about the intended use case of that event. Importantly, considering if the consumers of that event are gonna to need to reach back into your system to get more data, because that can increase the load on your system. And absolutely most importantly, consider the schemas of your event, because the schema of the event is your most tightly coupled part of this system. As always, thank you all for watching. If you've liked this video, then please like, please subscribe. If there's any future topics you'd like to see me cover around sustainable architecture, event-driven architecture, serverless compute, then please let me know in the comments or reach out on social media and I will see you all next time.